Before we uh, start, I'd like to give a, a, just a brief introduction for our panel because many of you may not know all of the composers. Paul Schoenfield is on the University of Michigan. Now he's a, he's a teacher there. He's both a master pianist and a composer. He studied with Rudolf Serkin, among other teachers, and toured extensively as a soloist, uh, by, and, and also with groups such as the Music at Marlboro group. Among his many records are the complete Bartok works for violin and piano. Primarily a composer today, he is the recipient of numerous grants and awards. His musical language embraces a wide spectrum. The jazz essence of his cafe music for piano trio is, to my ear at least, quite a ways from the more complex chromatic language of his viola concerto. Uh, but it all works together. He's composed a high rock ballet for amplified violin, sax, bass guitar, drums, synth, and piano, and a piece called Klezmer Rondos, and yet another piece called Country Fiddle Tunes. Speaking of country fiddle, <laughs> Mark O'Connor, as many of you know from last night, is a master country fiddler turned composer whose work is enormously popular. His music fuses the folk genre of country fiddling with jazz and contemporary classical music. His fiddle concerto has received over 200 performances, uh, an absolute grand slam in the classical musical world. His collaboration with Yo-Yo Ma and Edgar Meyer produced the Grammy Award winning Appalachia Journey album. His recent Americana symphony has been performed by several major orchestras to wide acclaim. He's also an active educator, founding and directing the Mark O'Connor Fiddle Camp and String Conference, and as well has been um, awarded frequent residencies at universities and music schools, such as UCLA, where I, I met him uh, this year. George Santakis studied composition with Hugo Weiskall and Roger Sessions at the Juilliard School. Countless musicians, including myself, know George from the Aspen uh, Music Festival, where he's been a champion of... Uh, of other people's music and just all kinds of great music. He conducts the Aspen Contemporary Music Ensemble. He fuses a wide variety of styles together and yet, uh, to me at least, is always distinctively American, very expressive and personal. Um, among many other awards, he's received a Grava Meyer Award and Grammy nomination for Second Violin Concerto and his Ghost Variations for Piano. He currently teaches at Bard College. Uh, best known as the drummer for the band The Police, Stuart Copeland is also a composer, of, a really versatile composer. Uh, he's composed many film scores. Uh, in 1983, he won a Golden Globe nomination for Francis Ford Coppola's Rumblefish. And he's written music for many video games. He's composed both an opera and a ballet, and he continues to compose many chamber works that fuse his particular percussion sensibilities uh, for the worlds of jazz, pop, and world music. I thought it would be really nice if we could take a short time to give each of you an opportunity uh, to, to, to just talk a little bit about your process or what you do or what, what concerns you in, in your music so that people can just get a little set, uh, a con set of some kind of context because when I give pre-concert lectures I notice there's a huge huge distance between the audience and people on the stage in concert music and I think whatever we can do to lessen that distance it makes for uh, an audience that's much more uh, keen intellectually and emotionally. I got my start uh, performing uh, at a very early age. I was a child musician, a touring musician by the age of 12 and um, I was already in the profession and uh, around that age, 12, 13, I started composing. I was arranging folk materials at that time, mostly, and then I started composing. Uh, by the time I was 16, I was composing uh, half of the material that I would record each year, and then by 17, all the material. And my background uh, that led up to this kind of creativity was equal parts of, uh, of Americana. Uh, I had uh, several years of classical training on instruments and uh, several years of jazz training and several years of uh, folk music, um, American fiddling. And as I uh, got into these uh, areas, um, I started to look for ways to combine my in experiences and influences into creating uh, a new music. And um, my pathway led through uh, the great Texas fiddler, Benny Thomason, who taught me a lot about uh, theme and variations um, experiments. And then I learned a lot of uh, improvisation from the master jazz violinist, Stefan Grappelli, when I toured with him in 79 and 80 uh, as a teenager. 
And those two became my violin mentors. And they both, uh, what they had in common with each other was that they were very, very creative and expressive and really uh, defined a whole new way to play the violin and the literature for it. Um, this is, uh, for me, something that uh, the masters in Europe were doing uh, just you know, 100 years before and, and before that. It was an extension. America was uh, promoting a new type of folk music. I always thought that was interesting that uh, American folk music continued to develop uh, while there was other countries around the world uh, who have wonderful folk musics. Um, America was always on the move, a journey to find something new. And um, this journey was very, very enticing for me. Uh, my own family migration uh, goes back 400 years in this country, crisscrossing the country. And, uh, and so I started to pull all these kinds of influences into my own creativity. And at some point in my uh, mid-20s, I realized that there was almost no uh, 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 interaction between uh, folk fiddling and classical violin playing. Um, there were uh, some crossover uh, projects and things like this, but the language itself, the, the literature and the language and the culture, I wanted to really delve into and try to bring into um, a modern uh, classical context. And so I came up with my first piece uh, that I performed last night, actually the Caprices, and that started to get a lot of attention amongst uh, violin players like Jimmy Lin um, uh, about 25 years ago. And then uh, I came up with the fiddle concerto. Now, uh, fast forward to this day, uh, six violin concertos and, and lots of chamber music. And I'm continuing to try to, to figure out how uh, and what kind of ways that American music can exist beautifully in a new kind of classical music. Um, uh, speaking from the violin perspective, there's the, the Russian school of playing, there's the French school, the German school, but you know, for 400 years of string playing in America, there's not really a school that you could actually identify. And um, so that's one of the reasons why I started my camps, um, where we see uh, over now between four and 500 students each summer now coming through these uh, string camps. And, um, and I, my idea is to offer classical education on the violin there, as well as jazz, folk fiddling, and world music. And I always thought that uh, if the world of string playing could come a little closer together, it would be more of a powerful force, and uh, string playing in general could maybe take a position that it held for 350 years before um, that uh, was at the very top of the musical profession in all ways, culturally, um, commercially, and um, just for the really the last 50 or 60 years, the violin has kind of dropped behind our culture. And uh, for so many years in America, it really helped lead the way. I often say, I, when I do my workshops, I hold the violin up and I say, this wooden box tells the story of America. And so I want to continue to do that with my uh, music and creativity. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Paul, would you like to share something about yourself or your music? I'd rather listen, actually. I found this fascinating. <laughs> now, there's a composer. Listen. Yes, yes. Yeah. That is, that, is, <laughs> that is a composer Thanks. statement. Come on. Uh, My only concerns in writing music are getting it done in time and trying to write a good piece. Uh, I think the first really new or contemporary piece of music I learned were the five pieces for string quartet of Webern, written in 1909, 100 years ago. And I was trying to think, where in music history has there been a 100-year gap where it could have been written yesterday and considered still a new piece? And so uh, I think I was actually in my late teens. I thought uh, classical music could kind of reach a point of stasis. And uh, it's, except for mathematics, I had a choice of going to mathematics or music. It was the only option. and. Uh, my interest in mathematics was in number theory, and I was told I'd very, very hard to get a job in number theory, so I went into music. <laughs> and uh, that's really about it. <laughs> and you found that path to be easy as, as, as anything, right? <laughs> as well. Much easier than mathematics. It's great. 
I don't know if it's much easier. I find writing music of all the things I do the most difficult, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. George, would you like to? Uh... You know, going to other countries, especially my native uh, Greece, uh, although I was born in Astoria in New York, which is the next best thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I go to Crete and Greece, and you know, they, they do. Uh, the, most of the European countries do maintain some connection with their roots. And if you go to uh, hear uh, Taiwanese music or you hear Korean music, they, they, in fact, the idea, they're bringing back the, the indigenous instruments or bringing them to the symphony too, as you know in, in your work, which is wonderful. But Zakir and uh, a lot of the, you know, these wonderful musicians bringing um, you know, the pipa to the orchestra, the Chinese instruments. So I think that's going on in not the same way as you might be describing it, but uh, Anyway, that was that, about that. Um, it, as far as you know, something Russell said about uh, my own music, if I were to give you a clue to my music, it's not about how I write music. That, that's misleading because anybody can write any music uh, the, whatever the way they want. What's important in my case is how I hear music and that informs how I write music. And basically, to, to get into what Paul said, I try to hear every music as if it's new. Everything is new. I mean, this, this aesthetical problems that we have about contemporary music, where's everybody going? You know, I mean, what, what path are we going on? You hear avant-garde music, you hear, and then they say, well, the composer's too traditional. Uh, when I hear Monteverdi, that blows my mind. I mean, and um, many of you have heard music that's so-called atonal and some people don't like that you know it's too like uh, dissonant but uh, sometimes I like to imagine that uh, in the 15 you know, around 1550 1500 everybody was writing 12 tone music like uh, Schoenberg you know this kind of very point which could, could have happened once we divided the octave not to get too technical but into 12 equal parts then we could have the 12-tone system, and they could have done that in 1500. You just put the notes in any order you want. You know, so imagine, for example, that the year 2009, now, everybody wrote that type of music, you know, and suddenly those guys, Gabrielli and Monteverdi came along and with their music, and you, and you went, holy cow, this stuff is like, wow, it's so modern, you know, and it, it sounds good, too, you know, I mean, it's got these tonal chords, the, the, the harmonies sustain, and it was when I started to listen to every music, Gesualdo, uh, Gregorian chant, as if it was new, because what's progress in art? I mean, you know, red is still a primary color, yellow is too, and I think uh, blue was last time I looked. <laughs> so, where's the progress? I mean, uh, if you listen to Bach cantatas sometimes, you know, it's like, holy cow, what is this guy doing, you know? And I got to realize that uh, progress was not uh, a, a chronological line going from left to right as we learn, we learn in uh, school, but it is rather the, it goes this way, and each one of these things is the life of the composer and the individuality of each creator. So when you get to the Bach uh, cantatas, you get to the late Beethoven. There's no, that, those are all modern works, you know. Uh, so in essence, the modern means the advancement of an individual, the, the, the vision of an individual, what it, whatever the period is. So I, I tell my students, don't try to be original, try to be yourself, try to build your, your ladder of that idea with uh, your own genetics and you will find your individuality. So I hear, I hear everything's new, especially if I haven't heard it before, so. <laughs> that's, that's a great insight into compo a composer's ear, I think. Thank you so much. Stuart, would you like to share some of your? Well, I'd, I'd like to build on what George just said, that um, you know, in my career, I've one minute a concerto for the Dallas Symphony, the next minute a jingle for Mountain Dew. Um, and what's useful about that is that the craft that you get from commercial music really is very useful when you have an idea of your own, when you really have a, an inspiration that comes from someone you want to express it, you get the craft from the work. Um, in a film for Oliver Stone or, 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 or Francis Coppola, it has to be happy with a little bit of darkness, 
but an element of doom, you know? <laughs> and you have to get these very specific moments because the music is the information for the audience. The guy, you know, uh, Tom Cruise looks into the woman's eyes and says, I love you, darling. The audience, she believes him. The audience needs to know that he's a lying son of a bitch. <laughs> And he's so handsome, and he's lit to look like the god of love. It's the music that tells him that he's lying. And in, when, when you work as a commercial artist, I'm sure this is true for the visual arts as well as music, you have to, the craft, how you make music work for you, you have a, a feeling and you want to get it out into the world. The craft that you get from commerce actually, actually comes in very handy. Um, I studied music here in San Diego, uh, not quite the institution as illustrious as, as our colleagues here, um, the San Diego School of Performing Arts, in fact, which was goddamn illustrious in my, room, my book. Um, but it was actually its Studio M at Paramount in front of a 90-piece audience, uh, uh, um, orchestra in front of me, and behind me is some flinty-eyed producers. That's where I learned my stuff. Um, pretty much just by saying yes. And hey, who can organize strings for, oh yes, yes, yes. But the thing is that's interesting about the development of music is that blue is still blue. Right. The primary colors are still primary. But uh, the, the cool thing about humans is that we're evolving. We've evolved intellectually and in our habits and in the world we live way beyond our biology. We're evolved, you know, evolution takes a long time. And we're evolved to be hunter-gatherers and basically to bang drums more or less in rhythm, which kind of unifies us as a tribe. You know, the, the function of music, I think, is as well as the human mating dance, it's also a tribal thing that binds us, you know, when we hear a rhythm. These are the, this is what we're biologically evolved for, but because we're so darn smart, we've taken it beyond. And even though blue is still blue and major is still major, we're getting better at discerning subtext, uh, mixtures of meaning amongst all that. You know, someone once said that, you know, uh, my dad once said that the Beatles music is just noise. It's just no clashing noise. That's not music. And it's just banging and clattering. And I wish I'd known then what I know now that dad, they're going to be teaching this in music schools. <laughs> And because, you know, I'm sure if we played Mozart with his incredible musical mind, if we played him some of George's music or Paul's music or my music or, you know, any pretty safe modern music, most of it would probably be atonal to him because he hasn't learned that these nines and these sevenths actually have musical meaning. And we, we grow, our species has been growing to accept more and more complexity in the harmony so that music that is actually pretty consonant to us now would have been really difficult Absolutely. back in the classics. And uh, I suppose it's the duty of us composers here to advance incrementally these so that we don't leave people behind. You know, squiggly music that's just, you know, 12 tones because there's 12 of them. Why not 13? Right. You know, uh, that's, 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 a, that's a challenge. But really, so that it still has meaning, so it still has feeling, so that you still feel something from it. We, it's our duty to expand it a little bit. Not too much so that we lose people, but a little bit so that it, you know, so that still, there's still new stuff that we can do. Can I, can I make just yeah, one of comment? Of course, sure. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, the primary color thing is so important in music, and, and, and they're still, right, red is still red, blue is still blue. But going from the happiest to saddest, don't you think there's, there's uh, major is happy, minor is less, and then there's Shostakovich. Well, then there's diminished, which is happy, sad. I always say when Shostakovich gets to a minor chord, that's the happy part. You know what I'm saying? Well said. Or I describe it as minor or worse, depending Blessed on the relief. Uh, to what extent do you feel that you have, that, that, that we have benefited in a, in a way by no longer embracing that really, you know, nosebleed uh, uh, avant-gardeism that, that was at least prevalent when I was first learning uh, to write music uh, and, and the kind of consolidation on one level we've done or do you feel in a certain way that what we're doing is actually moving forward and just are, and are just as experimental now but in a different way? Can I posit a notion? Uh, I would like to suggest that there's, uh, I don't know if any of these of my colleagues here today are culprits in this but at a certain point in modern music I think that composers figured Major, minor, uh, it's not enough for me anymore. There's 12 notes, let's use them all. And they invented kind of a number theory of music. And 
it could be said, you know, I'm sort of slightly outside the classical world, and as an outsider looking in, it did seem as if those composers left the audience behind. That it was very interesting for the composers to work out, you know, the algorithms of harmony, but in a way, that's when they kind of lost the public. And with some composers who were, you know, it seems only yesterday, but Philip Glass, oh, God, oh, John Adams, oh, but actually, it's so beautiful now, and I'm sure, I don't know how, you know, raise of hands, who loves John Adams in this room? I mean, is it so hard now? But when it first came out, it was not, not, not that minimalism stuff, and I think that some of the really adventurous composers who were trailblazers in developing harmony actually, in a way, killed the orchestra. And fortunately, there have been guys who come along, like George, who understands Atonality has a, has an impact. It has a has a, a, a an emotion to it, but you've got to keep it beautiful. And I think John Adams and, and and others as well. I think the orchestra is again becoming a beautiful instrument because the composers have have kind of been through that out in the cold and are now beginning again to write music that is both beautiful and challenging. I really like that. Then we should get some comments. Yeah. But uh, you know, I just came back from Aspen where I. We, uh, you know, I work very carefully with uh, six students, and there are six others studying there. And it's almost like your the, the lives are in your hands, and they're so influenced by this uh, the the composer. Uh, uh, you know, usually from Europe, the avant-garde types of cerebral type of writing, uh, getting more and more into the composer thing. And I joke around when I'm in Europe uh, because someone will say, you know, we went to this Huddersfield Festival, there was 1,500 people there, went to this fantastic modern music thing, 1,500 people, Warsaw Autumn, and there's 1,500 people. Then you realize it's the same 1,500 people. I mean. <laughs> I was talking to Paul Rutter's, uh, uh, Paul Rutter's a Danish composer in Aspen. He says, yes, the guy, you know, the, the man with the dog and the lady with that hat. And it, it is- They a, all had a headache anyway, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Now, but, but you know what? And I got to tell the students what to think, because they, they start off by liking that. And it's fine. It's wonderful in that milieu. It's fine. It's very inventive, it's, but it's small. And one thing about America is that, uh, you know, you go, you can do whatever you want. I mean, there's such an amazing amount of freedom. It's less so there, but these are wonderful little pieces, but they're not for, they're not music. I mean, in the sense, it's not for music. Um, you know, people like to ban warblers. They like to do, uh, you know, the, the people just study sauces and, and, and recipes. There's, uh, I have a friend who's the president of the American Hosta Association, so all just hostas that, you know, white and green hostas, and they're so into it, <clears throat> and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I taught at Carnegie Mellon. I went in once a week, and I stayed in the faculty house one semester. I, I commuted from New York. And every morning we had the continental breakfast. There were three Austrian physicists there. And they were the nicest guys. They knew about music. Yeah, music, oh, beautiful things. And we talked about art and culture and stuff like that. One day I walked into the, uh, into the dining room and, and one guy, one of the guys, Heinz, was sitting at this end of the table and the other two were going at each other. They were going to kill each other. I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I thought maybe uh, someone stole or something. Seventh. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't. They were physicists. They didn't oh, get, right, yeah, no, no, yeah. no. No, but I, and I, I sat up to Heinz with a coffee. I said, what's going on, Heinz? These guys are like, what, they're going to explode. He says, I said, what are they talking about? He says, without batting an eye, he's very bored, drinking his coffee. He says, well, they are, they are arguing the uh, theory about the surface area of cracks. <laughs> People are passionate about small things, and this is... And we've got to know about that surface area cracks or all your sidewalks are going to break. But, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, that's nothing wrong. This is a detailed thing, but that's not for music. I mean, music is, is giving, is generous, is, 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 you know, washing people, washing, you know, giving you what you really want. If you have one chance to be a composer, let's not, you know, board it up in a little room and stuff like that. But... Uh, be ext I mean, there's a certain amount of extra, extra version required. I think one of the things that's happened over uh, perhaps the last uh, 100 years of uh, tonal development, harmonic development, is um, something that um, we're always um, trying to figure out. It, the same thing happened kind of, you know, 
took place in jazz music too. Um, the um, one of the things that I think uh, is overlooked by um, a lot of us sometimes is the, the sophistication of stylistic development. And that's something that I really uh, have been concentrating on. Um, there's, some, there's such a diversity of American styles of music um, in, in the folk vernacular. And, um, and the, I was mentioning before, and, I, and, and maybe George, I, I might, made a, uh, might have said two different things and they got confused, but American folk music is something that's constantly developed, separate from classical music. Um, for instance, like uh, everybody knows the term bluegrass music now. This is not very old music. This was something that was invented in the 1940s. Um, and you can say Western swing. And there's so many different types of American styles that have developed from our folk traditions, separate from them being used in classical music environments. You know, obviously everybody knows that the, the gamelan and, and, and Hungarian gypsy music was, was uh, used by some of the great master composers. But in America, that's um, happened uh, to, to an extent, of course, Copeland and Gershwin opened the door to these things. Um, but it's not really been com completely shoved open all the way. And uh, I always found that very interesting, like the, there's always seemed to be a parallel universe between folk fiddlers and jazz fiddlers and violinists and classical violinists. And so I, I wanted to try to do more things to bring those two worlds together. And I think the stylistic development of the music is, is uh, something that's new. While looking back, you're looking forward to developing it. You know, quotation in music and referring to other music has been a very common uh, notion in music since, since music history began. You know, composers always, always had quotations, whether it was Beethoven, you know, having bird songs in the Pastoral Symphony, or, or Handel ripping off the latest uh, four measures from someone else's opera to put in his. When you incorporate a quotation or a reference to a particular type of music or style, are, to what extent are you the composer in control of that? And to what extent does it kind of start to play itself? I don't know if that's something you all feel, but it's something I've always wondered. So I, I'm going to ask you about that, Paul, first. Uh, what's that expression? Are there uh, two types of plagiarists, those that are caught and those that are never caught? Yeah. <laughs> then, uh, so, uh, yeah, and that Mr. Rinsky said you, you, if you're going to steal, you steal from the best, right? <laughs> Uh, but more interesting, I think, is this about what was said about the cracks. Everybody knows when you cut some wood, you're going to get sawdust. And so I was curious, uh, last year, what happens when you cut a piece of paper? Is there a loss of mass? And I asked the physicist at the University of Michigan, thought he didn't have it, couldn't tell me, so I asked an engineer also, and he didn't know the answer. Finally, I got the question, got an answer from a physicist at MIT, that if you could cut in between molecules, you'd have no loss of mass. Otherwise, there's going to be a loss of mass. I, I found that fascinating. That's the question to vote. <laughs> and, and, that, and that applied to your next piece in what way? <laughs> uh, no, I just thought it was uh, Absolutely. how the world works. I yes. thought it was an interesting thing. Well, let's have a screaming match about that right there. <laughs> How about the molecules coming from your fingers as you tear the paper? Interacting. Yeah. <laughs> so to turn that into this topic, when you're using, when you're writing like your klezmer rondos or whatever, to what extent does that the incorporation of those stylistic things affect the mass of your music and ideas? I wrote that piece shortly after I had first become well acquainted with klezmer music, and it really turned me on. And. Uh, like I said at the beginning, that uh, famous quote, I could say in in Kol Chadash Mitachat Shemesh, that King Solomon said, "There's nothing new under the sun," and especially in the early 20th century, when we already had 12-note chords, there's certainly not going to be any more harmonic development unless we go to a system that uses quarter tones or third tones or something. Who wrote that? That's not my tune, no. No, I didn't write that. That's not my phone, because I didn't write it. <laughs> Mine's 12 tones. So. I, I noticed that I in C know. major, and Schoenberg said there's still a lot of there's new music to be written in right. C major. There it is. And sorry. that Schoenberg quote that there's a lot of good so music sorry. still to be written in C major has really come true, hasn't yeah. it? Is that a contradiction, then? Schoenberg says there's a lot of music that could be written in C major, and you said it's all been done. Uh, or uh, For me, I've... I haven't, in all honesty, been able to get out of the fact that uh, the history of Western music has paralleled the development of harmony, even if it's not totally linear at times. 
but uh, since all 12 tongues have been used and uh, all right so what do we go with this next I haven't answered the question so maybe that's why I steal or write uh, <laughs> at the other time I think it was I just said at one point I'm not a classical composer anymore hmm. it's right folk written out folk music which is what I say I think I do interesting and uh, that's it uh, just a quick card. Uh, oh, oh, can I say one other uh, thing that's very important? Yeah. I don't want to contradict in a negative way anything. But in folk music, especially in Eastern Europe, minor chords have nothing to do with being said. I wanted to point that out. That's just kind of a learned ignorance that we all grow up with listening to Western music that makes yeah, us happy yeah. in minor set. In klezmer music, it's very happy to be in minor. It's exactly. fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say one thing about folk music, which Paul brought up. And um, it's something that you could actually make a distinction between folk music composers or creative people and classical composers, which I feel like I'm operating in both tracks uh, today. In folk music, um, you general, uh, generally want to contribute to the culture. Uh, and by doing that, by, f say, furthering or developing a fiddle tune, um, is that you're basically taking what was learned, you know, what you learned from uh, an older person and then uh, perhaps uh, uh, adopting most of it and maybe contributing a little bit to it and over, it, with each era it changes and eventually becomes the next fiddle tune. And this was uh, very evident um, in one of the biggest, I think, controversies in, in, a, in American classical music uh, with a guy named William Stepp who was a fiddler in Kentucky and, and in 1937, he recorded a piece um, on Alan Lomax's recorder. And he, what he said, it was variations of Bonaparte's Retreat, which was a tune that's been around for hundreds of years. But in modern day copyright laws, this would have been considered an, an absolute new tune. There was not a single phrase in it that, uh, that uh, mirrored the, the original Bonaparte's Retreat. So it was variated to such a point with each era, maybe with, even within William Steps' own family, that what he came out with in 1937 was in, in fact a new theme. And so, but he told Al Lomax it was variations on Bonaparte's. And so then it was recorded in Washington, D.C. Aaron Copeland goes down in 1942, five years later, and wants to, to look at some traditional fiddle music because he wants to find some themes for his new rodeo, his new symphony, um, and looking for the hoedown. And he found this, what he thought was a traditional PD, public domain, tune. And, um, and, and, and now, and he actually transcribed it note for note and little does William Stepp know that he just contributed the, probably the most famous piece to classical music in this country um, uh, through Aaron Copeland. And um, it was all by this kind of natural osmosis of, uh, of development within the folk traditions, which I think is very interesting. Well, Aaron, uh, Aaron Copeland, what would uh, Appalachian Spring be without the gift to be simple? You know, that's, uh, that's when the thing uh, amalgamates. So uh, he, he lifted it uh, brilliantly, and some would call that an arrangement in a way. It's an arrangement of a brilliant arrangement of a folk song. But I would just mention, Paul mentioned that you're not a classical composer anymore, and sometimes I do an interview or something, and then somebody says, you know, what's it like writing classical music? You know, and, and that's already a misnomer. I mean, <laughs> you know, I may be Greek, but I'm not classic yet. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, when they say that, I said, you know, I used to write classical music, but that was 150 years ago. I'm kind of doing something uh, new these days. But this is part of the problem that we don't have, we don't have a term. You know, we've kind of been ushered out of a term oh, that describes this, uh, th th you know, right. this activity. You know, yeah, concert uh, music, yeah. you know, uh, great music. We, we, you know, I write great music is always, always works. But uh, I, it, I know you, uh, you, you asked me about reference, something about reference. And, and people, you know, I, I like to borrow things, but I try to borrow the essence of things. It's like if I want, uh, if I think of my music as architecture, I may, it may sound like Beethoven, but I'm actually borrowing a curve from something in Beethoven, a, a particle of it, and it really gets me mad when people identify it as, as the thing that I picked out, you know. Right. So the, the idea sometimes is to, to pick, don't pick enough where they can actually tell what you're stealing, just put it... <laughs> 
a little bit of glint of Beethoven, Bach, or whatever, and uh, use it that way. Uh, we might want to lock the doors here. I'd like to conduct an experiment in divine physics. Um, when Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, he was wrong. <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> and what I mean by that, it's, it's demonstrated in the Olympics. Every year, somebody runs the fastest that has ever been run. The human body has been taken to its ultimate, ultimate, with the training. There's no going faster. This is the fastest person on the planet. And then next year, somebody goes faster. <laughs> um, and when he said there was nothing new under the sun, well, let's see, toilet paper, uh, dentistry with Novocaine, uh, saran wrap, all kinds of maybe frivolous items, but there is always something new because the human experience changes. And although we're probably still using um, the same 12 notes, usually divided into eight, um, or you know, the, in, this, in, in rock music particularly, it's still E, A, and D, and it's still boy, girl, and it's still electric guitar, but still somehow there is something new every time, because I think our human experience is always evolving, therefore the same tools of music, the same building blocks, to, to reflect the, the changing human experience, that's where the new stuff comes from. And when Aaron Copeland, who I've, I've adopted as an honorary uncle, even though he misspelt his name, uh, uh, certainly really, I mean, I, I've stolen from him and intend to steal a lot more. And from this august body here, I intend to steal the, 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 the Americana from Paul, the, the, the trombone glissandi I'm going to nick from George. I got that oh, yeah. right here in front of God and everybody, and I'm, gonna, I'm stealing that. Uh, it's a way of honoring people, unless it's a direct lift. And, but I don't think anybody intends for it to be a direct lift. I think we're, we're inspired by something that that's really cool. Now that, he's using it that way, but I can use it for this over here. And that's the way things move forward. I'd like to ask a question, uh, you know, getting off of the, some of the philosophical aspects of your music. I'd like to talk with you about the experience you have with the performers uh, here in La Jolla, because uh, we, we have first-rate musicians here, and you know, most of you travel all over the world hear, hearing your music, and I'd like to know, maybe you could share with the audience, what is that process like working with the, with the performers? They get the music, and then you have to come in and you kind of coach it with them and work with them, or, and, and do you find in, when you're in working with them, does it... Uh, does it show you new things in your music, or do you devise different techniques to try to get them, so to speak, in the groove that, that you heard in your head? I'd be curious if you have any. Paul, you want to add? Uh, actually, I very rarely hear premieres, and I don't know if it's tongue-in-cheek, but I say if I have to hear the premiere, the commission fee is going to be twice <laughs> what it would be otherwise. <laughs> uh, Why is that? Uh, it's not ready. Yeah, it's not ready. I've, I don't think I've ever written a piece that didn't need revisions afterwards. And uh, it's not, let them Stravinsky work it out. Stravinsky said he, I, I remember Arthur Berger told me that Stravinsky felt a piece always needed a year uh, of time after it was written. And he, and he, he put on his coat because it has to, has to fit well. And is that kind of the feeling you have that you have to work it out to get, to get it to have the right fit? Yeah, it just... Uh, I think when the writing process is dwelling on the things that might not work and uh, being a little fearful of hearing them, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe that's what it is, I don't know. This is a huge relief, by the way. I thought that these guys, professionals, would write it and it'd be there on the page and say, there it is. I thought it was just me having to get the players, and you know what, that bar there, I thought that was going to work, but it, it isn't going to work. Uh, do you think, and I thought that was just amateurism, in a way. And it's a great reassurance to see that you guys, who know what you're doing, actually have that same experience. Stravinsky himself, you say. Whew. We're all amateurs on this bus, yeah. really. I mean, uh, no, but it's, it's fascinating, the, where the... Um, I think, Paul, we, we write a piece and uh, you learn through experience that it, you, at first you think it's you that hasn't done something right. It could be you, but let's say you do everything right in the piece and the performers are fantastic. I mean, these are great musicians, but the, until they, it's like acting. I, you know, I, I act up in Woodstock, I'm in acting groups, and, it's, it, and, and the players are really actors. 
they have to feel the part. You know, you, you can't, I, I played Otto Frank in the Anne Frank story, it, and, and I was just saying the words uh, until I really started to feel what that was like to be uh, Otto Frank, and then, then it came alive. So we have the same thing, until the performers feel like the composer or feel like what the, what the composer is doing. And, and what I say is, I know I've had a good performance when the, when the performers start to breathe like me. That's the last thing they learn. They can phrase like you, they can uh, do the right tempo. When they start to breathe, because everybody breathes differently, and music is about breathing, I really think ultimately it's up high and down low, but it's, it's, it's breaths, human, humanness to it. So, and I had a great experience in Aspen a couple weeks ago because I, one of my pieces, Eclipse, has been recorded twice by brilliant groups commercially. I've heard probably 25 live performances of it, and I thought that was it. Two and two finally equal four. And at a performance in Aspen, these guys took it to heart. It was Joaquin Valdepenas, a great clarinetist, uh, principal of Toronto Symphony, and Paul Cantor, a violinist. There's uh, five players, four players. Two and two that night equaled five. And I could not see where they pulled it out, but they had. They did something, then I said, wow, did I write that? You know, it was like, and I'm sure, Paul, you guys all have had that performance where you say, it even be, went beyond what you thought it could be. It's like the actors did something to enliven the work, and, and that helps you write the next piece. You know, you say, uh, they, they really can add a lot. So they're actually discovering something you may not have... Uh you know, I think that's true with so, Beethoven you know. and, and Mozart. If, Mo if Mozart and Beethoven could hear the performances of their music after 50 recordings, people studying it and coming back, and then great performers go do it, I mean, they would have gone, wow, you know, my you know, Opus 1, 135, my quartet. Nobody could play it the way the Emerson or some of the groups play it now. Uh, and he, he would have just been ecstatic, yeah. I think. I think you're right, and I think it, just as we never listen the same way twice, and as we grow up listening with a piece, you know, our, our experience is completely different and with, with greater depth than we could have ever imagined when we first began to, to learn the piece. Well, yeah. I think that what this actually touches on is the purpose of the music, is to create, a, to, to have an impact on the audience, and the people creating that impact are the players. And if the players find something in their heart, in their personality, in their life, that brings those dots on the page, that's the real thing. Uh, regardless of whether that was a C natural or a C sharp, if the player can feel it and, and bring it out and give it meaning, that's what the dots on the page are for. They are only there to get the performer to do something, to, 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 to play something beautiful. And it's, it's all about when you rehearsing a new ensemble with a piece, it's about finding and understanding those players. And okay, it is this tune here, that is the tune, but you can learn something new about that tune, and it's for the player, it's to shine, it's to wake up that audience. That's what it's all about. It's not about that moment that you had back on your piano when you wrote that tune. That's not what it's about. It's about here now, in front of the audience, and making it live. It's getting easier for me to do. My, my style is becoming more and more well-known among string players. So by the time I show up at the first rehearsal, you know, many string players kind of know what they're going to expect a little bit. Um, some of them have uh, perhaps even played some of my music before now, maybe in a youth orchestra, and now they're, you know, now they're in the profession as soloists. Um, one, of the, one of the most uh, rewarding things as a, as a composer and a player was to, to uh, compose my Appalachia Waltz and then show it to Yo-Yo Ma in my living room. In, uh, I was living in Nashville at that time. This was about 15 years ago. And um, uh, going back to the question before, Appalachia Waltz was one of the pieces that I, I had composed where there was no revision. It was, it was literally written in, in probably under 30 minutes Every single note, every double stop, every nuance was there. I just played it into a tape recorder and then transcribed it. And it has stayed that way. I showed it to Yo-Yo Ma um, a few years later. And because of his unbelievable ability to express uh, music through his instrument, he showed me a different way to play it, even though there were no note, uh, note changes. Um, he brought out 
more of the essence of what I was trying to get. As an expert musician, he was able to help me realize how to play my own music better. And that was a truly phenomenal experience. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, you write a melody and Yo-Yo Ma plays the melody, just the melody, and you say, oh, did I write that? Wow, that's, um, I'm good. <laughs> um, but I, I, I don't, in case we run out, before we run out of time, I want to tie something together because these two guys that are on my side are so part of this idea. Uh, Mark, I mean, you know, I've been hearing you play for, you play the double concerto with Nadja Sonnenberg at uh, Aspen, so, and I have all of the CDs, and Edgar Meyer, who is one of my best friends. And I've really got to, uh, I, I admire you so much, and, 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 and Edgar, and uh, Bella Fleck, and uh, now Chris Tilly, terrific musicians who are writing music. It's so important to write music, and this is an oxymoron, because write music without words, and communicate. Because the big battle to me, and you come from a tradition where mostly song form, at least in the bands and stuff, you know, in police and everything, and I have I actually have a talk that it's a, a polemical kind of thing that begins with the title is America doesn't listen to music, because America doesn't listen to music per se. Maybe five percent of America listens to music. The other ninety-five percent listen to song, and songs are wonderful. There's no doubt about it. But it's a two, usually a two and a half minute form, that has words. It's not only music, it's words. And young people uh, have lost the ability to listen to any music these days, unless it's techno or something. Not only are we taking... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Unless it's techno. No, no, I mean, and, or something, or I something. I take exception. A techno is huge. I know, huge. Here we go, ladies. No, no, but, but I mean, <laughs> that's true. You're right, and we could, we could talk about that. But, and I'm glad that that's there. I'm glad Yanni, my, my, com my compatriot from, who I call Yanni, but, uh, <laughs> but, oh, but Mark, oh. these guys are writing a very fine type of music that, takes, uh, not, you know, gets, gets uh, young people off of words. You give them, uh, you know, from 5 to 15, you teach young people, you give them something to listen to without words, and they will do their own thing. They'll learn a language. It's a cognitive thing, just like learning a language. And that is so important, and it doesn't matter what music they hear. If it's jazz, uh, they might like jazz, they might be classical. But this is such an important battle. It's not about the sophistication. It's teaching young people, exposing them to music without words, and, and, and they'll take it any way they want. So I think we... I wanted to I, I want to pl play with that a little bit, because it's a, there, there's the question of the oral versus written tradition for composers, you, you as composers, because we have different backgrounds here where you come from, but it's also for the, for the audience as well. And it's a literacy question. And both traditions are very rich, but they produce a very different kind of endeavor. Rotation, well, rotation. well, I'm talking about, well, you know, yeah, specifically in terms of written notation, growing up writing it as opposed to growing up from, from an oral tradition, which, you know, some of the greatest musicians have had, had an oral background uh, of that. So it's not a question of judgment, good or bad, but it's a question of process, because it's very different and the results are different. I'd like to know from all of you uh, whether you, you know, how that affects you. Do you think, in other words, for those of you who, who come from a primary oral background, do you think if you had a hardcore or written notation background, would that affect the music you write? And vice versa, if you came from a really hardcore, you know, written notation, you know, going through the academia, do you feel having come from an oral tradition where things were more spontaneous, it would have changed the way you, you manifest your ideas? You want to start, Stuart? Um, in film composing, uh, BMI, who's a, never mind, they, they, they have these dinners of composers, of film composers, where we all sit there, 12 of us sit around a table, and we uh, talk, no spouses, just talk about, shop talk, and we are all amazed by how the other guys do it. Chris Young sits up there in his, in his room upstairs and he tinkles away and sings into a cassette player. The cassette goes downstairs and he's got some interns who, who scribble it out and uh, put it on a chart. He takes the chart and, you know, um, Tommy Newman, he just gets the right players in a room and they just kind of come up with stuff. Then he gets out his scissors and cut it up. I do it on a computer, you know. Uh, somebody else does it and writes it on, Danny Elfman does it on a, on a piano and it's mostly singing. You know, we all look at each other. How, how can you work that? way because my generation of composers we made it up um, the next generation of composers are studying Danny Elfman in school Danny himself had to make it up he had to, each composer in that composers night 
invented the wheel for themselves. For concertos, for serious music, there are schools for that and have been for hundreds of years. For film music, uh, there are only now schools for it, whereas the people in my generation, we had to just make it up. But just to take your point, written or oral, the, uh, the disparaging comment that is made by the chart guys who use the charts, they call the other guys Hummers. <laughs> which is, but the Hummers have an advantage, which is the improvisation. And the Hummers can think on their feet. They can improvise. They can take, like Tommy Newman, in my opinion, is the number one most beautiful film composer on the planet today. Tomorrow there'll be some kid who blows him off, uh, you know, blows him out of the water. But he does it by being able to work and communicate with the musicians. He is proudly a hummer, and he knows charts. He can read and write music. He's a Newman, for God's sake, you know. He <laughs> comes from a, fa a ge you know, several generations of, of film composers specifically, but he is still essentially a hummer, and he just gets the right players in the room, and he has a way to communicate with them to make the, oh, that's just beautiful. Ah, I didn't even know how to write that down, but that just is beautiful. And so there is that spontaneity, that, that elemental creativity that you get from humming that the composer who writes it down on a chart and then hands it over, he kind of contains that within himself. And I, I actually sit on both sides of that fence, but just in this company, I'll take the side of the hummers just for the hell of it, uh, where improvising is something that people who read really well tend to not be able to improvise, as I found yesterday, working with unbelievable players um, on this music. They're, as soon as they're playing the charts, there's you know a few bars that are written to be embellished. You know, those bars are, you got a chart, you're just scrubbing away there, but just you kind of zhuzh it up a little bit there, you know, add a little fairy dust, whatever, you got the, from your heart, the look of panic on this player. <laughs> they just don't teach that in the conservatories, you know. Uh, make it up for yourself. What, I'm playing Mozart? You know, uh, I can improve on Mozart? Well, actually, he probably would have loved it. Uh, my understanding is that he loved improvisation, but he was really good at writing as well. So this conflict between the Hummers and the writers is w a bridge that would well be crossed more often, I think. Take that. Okay. <laughs> I'm just imagining Stravinsky sitting there going, da 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 Well, try improvising on Rites of Spring. I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, any way you can do it, you know, what, what is that expression, any way you can uh, get... Jimi Hendrix would have had trouble with that. <laughs> yeah, really. Mark, you must do some of that... Uh, you know what I'm humming, talking about. Humming and, and writing and... Well, Mark is both, because Bar Mark comes through a tradition where the fiddle players make it up as they go along while sticking to a tune that is, everybody knows that song, and the fiddle player, like Mark, takes it beyond. Most composers um, have an oral... Uh, background to some extent. I think I, I, I think that there's some kind of uh, probably connectivity between oral learning and um, and participation and creativity. And like it was already said that the people that sight read very very well um, are, are often not uh, the best improvisers out there. So there's only so much that the, <laughs> the, the, the brain can do but um, I think that the, for most composers, there's probably an element of both. Now, I, I can just give you a, an example of my own childhood. For the very first six or seven years, all I did was read music. And then when, um, when I started to learn orally, was the first time where I felt like I could be creative. And then I started thinking, oh, I could change that. And then I could, I could maybe add another section here and segue you know, between the A and B differently, and then I could maybe do a different wrap-up phrase. And I, I, those kinds of ideas started coming to me as a young boy, but I, I don't think I would have had the same kind of experience if, it, if I continued only reading music. Uh -huh. So be, getting away from that actually freed your creativity to, to create structure, musical structure. Paul, do you know? Uh, our notation system is based almost totally on powers of two, and I just have always had a hard time believing that every time we have a dotted eighth followed by a sixteenth, it's supposed to be one to three relationship. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. But if a player feels that way and he's auditioning for an orchestral job and he feels that, well, actually the sixteenth should be a little closer to the next beat, probably won't get the job. 
even if possibly even that's what the composer felt. But today, I, there's this literalism I'd noticed among students. Uh, so I, was, I can see why they don't improvise. I mean, they just no, spat that up. <laughs> literalism. Yeah. As far as Hummer's concerned, uh, Stuart, I think you're giving us to uh, us notators too much credit. Not I just mean, rattling your cage. No, I mean, I basically, you know, I just you're riding my bike or something, and I'm humming, and then, and I'm getting these ideas like anybody else. It starts from an oral tradition. I can sing some, whatever. I get home and I say, how am I going to express this? And then I say, wait a minute, I know how to write music. I can notate this. I mean, I think we how, all how do you communicate it to the other players. When you have a piece that you wrote, that's right. do you give them a page of music to read? Oh, okay, that's what I play. Or do you go, I, we're, in, we're in A, kind of like a thing. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, yeah, you play that. That's cool. And then what are you going to do? Uh, you know, that's, that's what humming is. You said is. it yourself. The, com the communication to the other players. You said that yourself. It's a bunch. We write a bunch of dots and mezzo forte and poco forte and stuff. Italian. Community. We still got to so be there. Cool I, th I think we still have to be there to, to say how the notes come alive. So it's it's a little bit of that, a right? Bit of humming. Right, right. For instance, I, I had the ple pleasure of sitting in a little bit on your rehearsal, and you know, you're playing. You know, you've got this music completely internalized orally, at least what I saw in the rehearsal. But there's some guy back there with a score helping these musicians to put that together, right? Well, he's got yeah. a chart. I don't have mm -hmm. a chart. Yeah. So when I say well, that, that part that goes dully bum ba dum mm -hmm. uh, actually the best, most efficient way of expressing that is bar 120. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you, have to, and you have, to, have to have a sense then of where that is and where they're all going. Well, but yeah. then, then, then yeah. there's the time when, since I don't have a piano next to me either, uh, that's the wrong note. That, 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 yeah, that, 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 that's humming. Okay. Instead I'm of C sharp. <laughs> these guys would say, make that a C sharp. <laughs> Russell I, I, uh, and, and Stuart, I, I do both. I, I have a jazz band. And so there's a lot of times where I'll be doing, just do something and, then, you know, and hum to them, hum a phrase, work out some music. Then there's uh, the process of orchestration. If you're composing for a symphony orchestra, everything's got to be nailed down. Yeah. I mean, I did, um, I, uh, I had a lot of percussion in my Americana Symphony, and it's, so, so it's great to be up here with um, such incredible percussionists and, and uh, percussion writers. But I, I did a lot of work trying to articulate each hit on a, on a, on a percussion instrument. That took me, um, uh, I think, more time than the string writing. Mm -hmm. Probably um, I, I know it was, it was a big deal, and I had four percussionists in this American Americana Symphony, and so it was really a thrilling, but a very, very long journey. <laughs> now, there's no question that we're that one of the most exciting things going on now is that that barrier is being broken between the improvisatory and and uh, you know and the, the rigid you know intention, and that that's something that, like you say, you expect the performers now more and more to be comfortable going both worlds, and the composers. I'd like you to give a hand to these amazing panelists. For your time today.